The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Norma Jennings Edwards, was born and grew up in British Guiana. Writing on music and consciousness in the July 2008 of Spirit magazine, our guest today, uh, Reverend Edwards, quoted Pythagoras, the fifth century philosopher, as saying, there is geometry in the humming of the strings, there is music in the spacing of the spheres. And Reverend Edwards asked, are we as aware also that each of us is a living symphony of frequencies, a harmonious note in all creation? and that all life is rhythm. She phrased that as a question. But the young Norma did not come to that understanding easily. As she says in the first page of her book, Awakening, her life was designed to evoke drama even while she was still in her teenage mother's womb. The daughter of an unmarried 16-year-old, the pregnancy caused turmoil in the community and eviction from their community church. The pastor read Norma's mother and father out of the church, And to add to the pain, they were read out by the baby's grandfather, who happened to be the pastor of that Brethren Church. A powerful spiritual sign attended her birth since she was born with a cowl, a white membrane covering her face. The midwife told her parents a cowl was considered sacred by the elders, that this child was born with a special purpose and with the ability to see into the spiritual as well as the physical worlds. There were heavy rains and floods happening during her birth, and for eight days following, flood, flooding towns and villages in the area. And the elders voiced their beliefs that the heavens opened up to usher a seer into their midst. Growing up, Norma was somewhat shy, a dreamer who loved nature and only wanted to be treated like other children her age. She renounced her ability to see auras, and when it was prophesied she would be a pastor, her unhappy reply was that she just wanted to be a teenager. Her father was a school teacher, one of only eight certified school teachers in the country. He encouraged her to read, which was good since the probing spiritual questions she thought about seemed to annoy the pastors she went to for answers. Her book details the wisdom keepers she met along the way in her life. A surrogate grandmother told her her grandmother's stories of life in Africa and life as slaves. She taught her to sit in her own rhythm because, quote, Life's better in your own rhythm. At the age of 12, she unexpectedly surrendered her life to Christ at a tent revival service. And when she told her grandmother she was saved, her grandmother said, where did you get this idea in your head that you weren't saved before? Norma's aunt Sarah came to visit and told Norma an angel had whispered that Norma had a calling to minister to people in far off lands. And when she met and later married her first husband at age 19, They moved to London with their firstborn son, where that prophecy began to unfold. Reverend Dr. Norma Edwards, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you so much for just a beautiful summary of the book. It's (laughs) a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. And you have written a wonderful book. I I don't always recommend the books uh, whose authors I interview, but this one was spectacular, I thought. Thank you. Norma, in London, you were pregnant and feeling labor pains at four months when you got onto an elevator to leave work early. Tell us who you met there and what happened then. Well, I stepped into the elevator in pain. And in those days, elevators stopped with a jerk. And when the elevator stopped with a jerk, it seems like all hell broke loose inside of me and I collapsed. In that elevator, the only other person with me was a Hindu woman, Hindu young woman. And I knew she was Hindu because she wore her, she had her traditional, her traditional clothing on and the dot in the forehead of the head. And she moved very quickly, recognizing that since the hospital was about three blocks away, she got help and got me into a cab where I collapsed and got me to the emergency room. 
Now, doctors, of course, I'm unconscious and they're asking her, what is her name? I don't know. Is she married? What do you know about her? She knew nothing about me, but she stayed. She stayed the entire night until um, they had to call the police, take a picture of me and put it in the hands of the police so that they can find out who I was, where I was from, and, and, and such details. But she graciously stayed until morning. And by the time they found my husband, I had already had surgery. I had already flatlined. I had already returned back to my body. But she was very much there. And a beautiful friendship emerged from that meeting. So that I got the opportunity to walk with a deeply traditional and religious Hindu woman right by my side. And there I was, deeply religious Christian. But we made a pact, you see. And that pact was we would never talk about religion so that we would keep the friendship. Until three years later, we're walking in the park together and she looked at me and she says, let's talk about grace. And I said, but that's religion. We made an agreement. She says, yes, I know, but um, I've been observing your life, she says. She says, because you see, in my tradition, when we feel that we have sinned and when we feel that we need redemption. We have got to go find animals without a blemish, which is rather costly. And we bring it to the, to the sanctuary, so to speak. And the blood from the animal is scattered on the four corners so that we could receive redemption from our sins. He said, and you know, if you're poor, that keeps you in poverty. Because every time your son or your daughter or you yourself sin, it's costing you money. She says, but I noticed that you live in this Christian religion and you've got the assurance of a redemption from a man who gave his life on the cross. And so we began to discuss the differences in our traditions and in our religion. Isn't it amazing? We remained friends until she migrated to Australia and I went back to Gaia. When I read about this, I was so struck. I didn't realize that the Hindu tradition was so close to the old Jewish temple traditions yeah. of sacrificing animals and, 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 and the blood and all of that for um, the you know, forgiveness of sin. I thought that was really, really interesting. So she was with you in the hospital while you were having your near-death experience, wasn't she? Yes, she was. Wow. And I was hospitalized for about 10 days after that, and she came every day wow. at lunchtime and well, sat with me. Tell us about your near-death experience. Well, I, was, I had just turned a couple of days from my 26th birthday. And I had been on and off away from work because of, of pains that I was feeling and I was just not well. And this was my first day that I returned back to work. And I um, wasn't feeling well all day, but that jerk in the elevator just about did it and um, found myself in an emergency room. Now, the last thing that I remembered was excruciating pain. And then the next thing I remembered is I am on the ceiling looking down at my body on an operating table surrounded by medical personnel. And I am truly confused. I'd like to say here that my ability to process seemed to be more enhanced in that state that I was in because I can, I can see the, the concern on the, on the faces, et cetera, of those who were working with me. They're working against time. And I wanted somehow to be able to assure them that I was fine because I'm on the ceiling. I can't explain this, but I feel absolutely fine, calm, exhilarated, no fear. 
And so um, the first thought that came to me was, um, how do I get off the ceiling? <laughs> this is one of the things that I teach today is that your thoughts are very powerful and they lead to manifestation. Because as soon as I thought it, I was on the ground, standing on the ground. And I'm trying to communicate to the doctors, it's fine, you do not need to to carry out this medical procedure because I'm fine. And of course, they're they're not observing me. It seems like they can't see me. So the thought in my head was, the females in the room, which were the nurses, are usually more um, emphatic. They are usually more uh, sensitive. So I moved from trying to engage the attention of the doctors to trying to engage the attention of the nurses, but nobody could see me. Now I'm even more baffled. And then I flatlined. And when I flatlined, I noticed the graph on the machinery. And in my head, I'm like, I can't be dead. I am very much alive. (laughs) And then, of course, the doctor turns to pick up the paddles, you know, to kind of like shock the heart back in. And for some reason, in the spiritual realm, I could see the corona of electricity around it. And the thought in my head was, I'm not dead. If they apply that much electricity to my heart, they will accidentally kill me. How do I get out of here before they take my life? And with that thought, I found myself through the ceiling and into an extremely dark tunnel. The darkness was so deep, I could feel it in my soul. And I'm traveling through this tunnel, and halfway through the tunnel, a light appears, a speck of light, and it begins to oscillate and get larger and larger. And of course, my, all of my attention got drawn to the light. And I'm moving swiftly through this tunnel. And then I, it's like I come around a curve and I could see this phenomenal crystal clear white light before me. The thought in my head was, if I survive this, I'll probably lose my eyesight because the velocity of the light before me was so strong, I figured it would burn the corona out of my eyes. And then I merged. Lee, there are no words in any language to describe the joy, the serenity, the peace as I merged with the light. And in merging with the light, I was very aware that I had become love. It's as though I kind of understood that whatever spark of love I was carrying inside of me had just been tremendously expanded. Can you imagine that? And I'm standing there now and I'm thinking, how does one get around in this environment? As soon as I ask the question, I am moving. Now I am drawn to an outdoor area and there is this coliseum it looked like, you know, with the large pillars. Yes. And two and a phenomenal television screen at that time. We did not have these large television screens. It stretched from one column to the other. And as I come to a stop, the television screen lights up and it begins to scroll very slowly. And now I can see that it is divided into three columns. On the left hand side, is my life as I had planned it and the way I had lived the 26 years on earth. In the middle column were all the conditions that came to me during the 26 years that I lived to help me fulfill what was on the left side. And here I begin to laugh because I could clearly see that since I had no idea what the plan was, I have spent most of my 26 years asking or praying for things that had nothing to do 
with my life's purpose. And by so doing, it seems as though I had dropped these like large boulders. I could see like a road in front of me. And it's as though every, every, at every so many steps, I can see a boulder being dropped in my way, which means I have to slow down now. And I have to figure out whether I, can, I have to climb over the boulder or I have to go around it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And now I am thinking, how stupid could I have been? Because somebody taught me how to pray. However, they didn't teach it to me correctly. Because all of my prayers as a young person was, I wanted to succeed in life. I wanted to be rich in life. And those were the things that I was praying for. And guess what? Most of them got manifest. The manifestation was now in my way because when I look at column one, I had not been praying to manifest the destiny that I came with. Does that make sense? Another thing that I noticed at the record is that we cannot, we don't get paid twice for whatever it is we do in this world. And while it is true that we have to make a living and we have to use our skills and our initiative in order to make a living, when we get paid for doing the job on the job, we're paid in the earth's uh, money, compensation. The blessings come to us, I saw it in the record, when we give ourselves freely and we are not paid for it, then the universe has to pay us. And the blessings that come in that payment are infinitely more powerful because they have more to do with our, the plan that we came with and fulfilling that plan. Am I making sense? Yes. Jesus said we, those who get their rewards on earth, like the rich man, don't benefit like those who do not. I saw it in the record. I saw it in the record. And so on the, the far side, the last column now was very interesting. Because it looked as though someone had created a stamp. And the stamp said, objective not accomplished. Objective not accomplished. Right. Objective not accomplished. And now I'm standing there feeling like a fool because this is the way I planned it. Here were the opportunities that were given to me. I messed up. And in 26 years, I had not accomplished anything in my, in my life's plan. Now, when I was a child, as you read in the book, I had a tremendous amount of questions, biblical questions, because I spent all of my childhood in church. And so I've been walking with a number of um, questions that pastors couldn't answer. But the one that haunted me the most was that piece of scripture where Christ said, I came so you can have life and have it more abundantly. And I said to the pastor, but people have been dying ever since. What what did he mean? Was he lying? Or is there more to life than we know? That one got me into trouble. My mother decreed that I should never again ask a pastor another question because I was embarrassing the family. I'm asking questions they can't answer. Well, the screen I'm standing before in my near-death experience begins to re-scroll. And now they have dropped six past lives into the screen. And I'm now reviewing seven lifetimes. And boy, was that an eye-opener. You know, we have a life before life. We have a life in between life. And then we have a life when we return. And I saw that quite clearly as the screen began to re-scroll. I saw myself in very ancient times when the earth had no electricity and we really walked with torches. 
I saw myself living in dire, dire, dire poverty with no hope. I saw myself in, in biblical times at the, when Moses was pulled out of the bulrushes. I was one of the women who was there. I saw myself as a ruler with pomp and ceremony and power. I saw myself as a male. The lifetime that I brought back with me and probably contributed the most to my growth and my development was I saw myself as a child picking cotton in the fields in America as a slave child. And I'm bent over picking cotton and I could hear the hooves of the slave master as he's coming along the line and I can hear the whip when it hits the the back of a slave. And I'm scared, I'm afraid because when he gets to me, I'm only a child, I can't meet the quota. When he gets to me, I'll feel the whip on my back. And then they move the lifetime to the next lifetime. And here I am, I'm the slave master on the horse working that whip. We're all one. We come from the same source. We have different lifetimes. We have different experiences. But that one I brought back with me and contemplated deeply on it, which led me to the eight spiritual teachers I talk about in my book. And among them were four serious pastors and there was a husband and wife an elder in Guyana 90 years of age he and his wife yes that's brother and sister right that's right yeah let's I I did want you to mention though during your NDE you came to a river just before you you came yes Yes, after I reviewed, thank you, after I reviewed the record. Again, I asked, how do I get around here? And I was moved to the river. And you know, we sang that little chorus. Yes, we will gather by the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river. It flows from the throne of God. There is a river. And I was taken to the river. And on the other side, this was very interesting. Thank you for reminding me of that. On the other side of this river were hundreds of folks, many of whom I could not recognize from their faces, but I could feel the love that existed between between us. Tremendous amount of love. And they were beaming this love, welcoming me into their midst. And then my aunt, who was the most recent um, person to pass over in my life, she stepped into, she stepped into the river and she began to walk towards me. And I did the same. So we're moving, wading in the water together. And just as we get very close and I'm anticipating that we would hug, she looks at me and she says, I'm sorry. They're telling me that you have to return. They're sending you back. And I said, why? And she says, well, they're sending you with a message. And I said, well, there are millions of people back there. They could find somebody there and give them the message. And they said, no, we're sending you back with the message. And the message is, there's more to life than meets the eye. Life is eternal. And with that, I found myself falling, falling, falling at the speed of light and literally crashed into my body who was, that was still on the anesthesia. But in that moment when I crashed, I came awake momentarily. The pain, the ultimate, this body that we reverence so much and we dress it up, it's not a precept. And it certainly is not very comfortable 
when the spirit enters the body. It was cold, it was clammy, it was smelly. And that all that wonderful energy of love and light and resilience and hope and joy disappeared when I entered the body. Now, it's time now to readjust. For the next three days, I was completely out of sorts. I suspect because today I can, I can get in and out of the body quite easily. But I suspect because I crashed into the body, it just completely put me out of an alignment. It took about three days feeling very, very, very unaligned and not comfortable at all in the physical body. But when I opened my eyes, there were two nurses. I was in a recovery room and there were two nurses sitting at the table. And I guess they were observing me. And they had a radio between them and it was playing classical music. And as I opened my eyes, I discovered that I could see the notes. I could hear the notes, but I can see them. Every note is tied to a color. Every color is tied to a number. Every number is tied to a mathematical symbol. And they're all moving in unison. They're interacting in unison. And I'm opening my, I'm open with my eyes open. I can see how that energy is interacting with these two young people who are sitting at this table. And every now and again, a doctor or not a medical personnel may come along. And again, I'm fascinated by the fact that they are absorbing this energy and watching their auric field. You know, we have a field of electricity around us. It's very colorful. So I'm mesmerized. I'm fascinated by this. Uh, They hospitalized me for 10 days. And it took that much time for me to get over my absolute, absolute distress at being sent back from a place of love and joy and harmony to face a world (laughs) that it seemed to me that was completely unaligned. You wrote in your book that following this amazing experience where you had even regained your ability to see people's auras, you faced three years of depression. and Serious uh, depression. And three attempted suicides. Tell us about that. Well, of course, once we have gotten the taste of living love as we truly are, it's very depressing to come back to this world. Yes. And the depression came because now all of my desire is to return to this beautiful, wonderful place that I experienced. But I have a son, I have a family, and now I'm kind of ashamed of the fact that I want to, I'm uncomfortable with leaving my family behind and going to the other side, you see. That held me in depression for a long time. At the third attempt, uh, I got very even more depressed at the fact that I couldn't even kill myself. (laughs) (laughs) After the third attempt, I was hauled back to the other side in a dream, in a dream state. And there I was met by a team of nine nine, uh, guides, I guess, you call them that. And they let me know quite um, categorically that they will not entertain me attempting to take my life again. And that if I did and I succeeded, they would only slam me back into a baby's body and send me back, which would make life even more difficult because I'd have to learn how to walk, to talk, and et cetera, et cetera. That the way I was returned as an adult into an adult body, it was infinitely better for me to finish out my purpose. From that point onwards, my desire really was to return if only, one, if only for one experience. And the other desire was to find the truth. The third attempted suicide, you were saved by your son in a remarkable way, in a yeah. remarkably symbolic way. Tell us a little about what he he showed you 
Well, this was a day when I, you know, us women, if we're going to die, we have to clean the house first. <laughs> <laughs> so I cleaned the house. I cooked dinner. <laughs> And I got myself ready, you see, because I had taken the time to determine from a friend of mine who was a nurse exactly how many pills I needed to really make this thing happen. And um, I, I, I fed my son and I sent him outside to play. And um, I got into the bathroom and I'm standing with a glass of water in one hand. The other hand is the pills. And I'm saying my last prayers before I leave. And I'm asking God that he will take care of my son while I'm gone. And he comes running into the house. Mommy, 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 look what I found. The excitement in his eyes, the excitement in his voice. And when he opened his hand, what he had in his hand was a, a butterfly emerging, halfway emerging, out of, it, it was just amazing. But I looked into my son's eyes and I saw the excitement. He says, mommy, mommy, look, 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 the butterfly is coming out of this worm. And the thought in my head said, and who would explain to him the mysteries of life? I turned my hands down and let the pills go in the toilet followed by the water. And I picked myself up, picked my son up, and I took him to the park. And it was just one of those absolutely amazing days. I call that my second rebirth. That was my second rebirth. Yes. My son is now in his 50s. And every birthday, I remind him that he brought me back from a point of suicide. There was another story you tell in your book. You were on a bus and you said Ooh. your brain shifted. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in the process answered a nagging question. How does the soul on the other side prepare for entry? Tell us what you learned from that. <laughs> yes, that, that was very, that, oh, that one was. And of course we lived in England at the time. And um, I'm on a double-decker bus. And I, um, by this time now, I'm meditating, you see. I know how to meditate. And I can sit still, and I can get out of my body. And I made a shift, and I was out of my body. <laughs> and um, I was carrying my second son. And um, there I was, and... I made a journey up through the dimensions and there was my son's soul and he was putting his life together. Absolutely amazing. We, 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 first of all, I didn't realize that um, we, we select our parents. Regardless of how horrible they are or, or how beautiful they are, we make the selection based on the lessons we need to learn. And so the soul takes a look at maps. There are many maps. There's maps of the universe. There's maps of the earth. They look at the lineage and the ancestry of these people that they would like to, to um, be their parents. And, and initially, when they're looking, they're looking at more than one couple, you see. And they're looking at lineage, they're looking at heritage, they're looking at ancestry, and they're looking at how that is aligned to the part of the earth where they would like to be born. And when they find, when they think they have found a couple, when he, th he thought he had found a couple that he wanted to request, because you request of your parents whether or not they would agree to parent you. And um, and then once, you, once you, 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 you find them, you speak to them in spirit. They are in the physical body. You are in spirit, the being wanting to be born. But you find a way through the dream state to, to make the request. And I also saw that sometimes uh, they, 
a soul may decide they want to be born through the lineage of, let's say, their father, the one person they want is their father. And when they make the request, the father may say, I have other plans for when I'm on earth. But if you would, would, would agree, I would parent you. I would father you, but someone else. You'll have to pick someone else to raise you. So I watched him put this life together. I watched him put the obstacles that he needed in the life. I watched him put together the places where he will be resilient enough to come through. It it was a phenomenal thing to observe and to really understand, you know, pastor, no, I'm going to call you pastor here. We got to stop this thing about the devil. We put adversity in our lives because we know from the other side that that's the best way we will learn. Adversity teaches wisdom. Who feels it knows it, Lord. So I watched my son put his life together. And I watched him promise me that if I can get past the fear, work on putting the fear aside, together we will make the birth Very simple and very easy. I had 30 minutes labor and my son came into the world and I went back to sleep in a hospital bed and woke up like all the other people in the hospital. The interesting thing about that journey, though, was, of course, I was out there and I was fascinated by everything I was observing and understanding. When I opened my eyes, The bus had come to the terminus. All the passengers were gone. They had called an ambulance because they couldn't wake me up. (laughs) And they were about to put me, (laughs) you know, put me onto the ambulance. And I opened my eyes and I said, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, I don't need to go to the hospital. I'm perfectly fine. It took me to the hospital anyway <laughs> and ran their tests, et cetera. But it was an awesome experience. Yeah. And it's a wonderful teaching story because not only do we reflect on how children put their lives together before they're born, it's how we put our life together before we were born. It right. gives us a mirror to look at. Um, you know, what was amazing about that story is my son just got married. That son just got married. Oh, congratulations. I watched him live the life that he put together on the other side. And in watching him, I was able to not get as panicked. See what I'm saying? When adversity came along. For a variety of reasons, you and your husband and family decided to go back to uh, British Guiana. And when you got there, you were looking for a teacher. No, I wasn't looking for a teacher. I I, I think the teacher found me. I had questions. And by then, I was quite clear that pastors could not answer the questions that I had. He found me. But there was a fellow that called himself Brother Mm -hmm. who uh, cleared land and Mm -hmm. couldn't even read or write, which is an amazing thing. And yet, well, tell us about brother and sister. Brother and sister, we we arrived in Guyana, and of course we bought a piece of land and we needed land cleared so we could put a building on it. You know, you you get back home and you ask her, and everybody said, oh, brother, everybody called him brother. Mm -hmm. Or brother is the ideal person that you need. And, And when we showed up for this meeting with brother, we realized that brother was... At the time, I didn't think he was 90. I thought he was probably 70 going on 80. And I'm thinking, but this is an old man. So obviously, he's probably going to um, supervise this activity. And um, so we hired him. And then the very first day, my husband sent me out because he had to go to work. He sent me out so that I can go take a look at what the crew looked like. And when I got there, the crew, it was himself and I think his great, great, two great, great grandsons. And I was like, absolutely amazed. But it was, 
the sacredness, the reverence that you felt in, in his body, in just watching him move. There was something about him that, that, that I was intrigued by. And then, of course, when I watch him, I mean, work right alongside these two younger men, where did all that energy come from in a body that old, you know? And so I became so fascinated that I would, um, I would get in the car during the day and I would just show up, you know, to observe the work that was taking place. And... Um, I think the very first time that I engaged him in conversation was when I watched him. It was lunchtime, and he carried this little bag, a little handmade bag, and it was lunchtime, and they stopped to have lunch, and they had dug a water hole, and he went and he washed his hands, and he washed his face, and he dried it, and then he opened this bag, spread a towel out, and put a Bible on top of it. And I thought that was very strange. And um, I think that was the first, first question I asked. Do you always take a Bible everywhere you go? And he says, yes, you got a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> but see, by this time, I had this burning question of who I am. Because now you, can, you have to understand that now I've got the ability, I can get out of my body and I can travel. And, and that was not in keeping with Christian teaching. Do you know what I mean? So I'm asking this question, who am I? What have I become? Is this good? Is this bad? And, and, and the, the, this burning question surfaces in my mind every time I see him, you see. And um, finally, I asked the question. And when I asked the question, he said to me, um, but before I, before, I asked him the, before I asked him that question, uh, <laughs> I had this thing about, a question about where did the two wives, women that Adam and Eve, sons married, where did they come from? I walked with that one for a long time. Nobody can answer me. And some people were giving me some answers that were not. You've heard some of those answers. And so I asked him the question and he threw his head back and he laughed uproariously. Now I'm feeling kind of stupid, you know. And I said, well, this is this a silly question? He says, no, but where did Eve come from? And I said, well, it tells you in the Bible. God put Adam to sleep and took a rib. And he says, well, what makes you think that... God went on to the business of making women. <laughs> he said, you see, the Bible could not hold all, all the experiences that happened in the world. So somebody had to be very careful about repetition. He said, so they were assuming that we were sensibly enough to know that if he made one woman, he could make more. And the answer seemed so natural to me that I was like, damn, now I can see why he was amused that I'd been walking with that question for so long and nobody could answer. <laughs> so he took me to his wife so she can help me with the understanding of who I am. So that's a woman's question. So he took me to his wife. And his wife, as you read in the book, said to me, um, oh, go on home. We'll come next Saturday to your home and we'll talk about this. And what she did was put me through an experience that put my children through these days, my grandchildren now. And she walked us through the house, myself and my husband. And at first she had my husband walk her through the house and and she congratulated him on having provided a beautiful home for his family and congratulated me on how well I kept the home. And then she snapped her fingers. When she snapped her fingers, she brought seven other elders with her, female. They began to dismantle their house. And I'm standing there thinking, 
I don't want to insult, but what is going on here? So I offered to help. She says, oh, no, you, you just have to observe. This is an observation exercise. And then the women began to unhang the um, art on the wall, to call the pictures, pull the, 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 the furniture into the middle of the room. And, and I, had, I had a thing in those days about crystals, you see. And I had a whole display of crystals in my living room that was sitting on the beautiful controlled light. So you can imagine when you walk into the room, there's all this crystal and um, there's all this light. You see, it was like a blaze of light. Or they dismantled that very carefully put on the floor. And they moved through each room and did the same thing until they came. And so the, the room that we used as a, as a, as a I guess you could say a library in an office. And on the walls, we had hung all the credentials and the, the nice things that people had said about us on the walls. And they took all of that off and put it on the floor. Now the house looks as though it's ready for movers. And she says, now let's go back to the living room and start, start this process again from the beginning. And as she walked me through through each room, she did with the same words. I can't, she said, tell you who you are. You have to find that out for yourself. What I can do for you is teach you who you are not. And all this stuff that you have amassed and gathered is not who you are. And you will have to engage a journey that will take you inside so that you will come to know who you truly are. And then when she was finished, or when she got to the when she got to the office, she threw her head back and she laughed and she says, and you know, this is not who you are right here or right now. This is what people say you are. And they were willing to vouch for that by putting it into writing, etc. She says, but now you are going to have to live, try to live your life in keeping with these laudable words. And when you have lived your life in keeping with these laudable words, then and only then you can claim this as your own. And then she left with singing and laughter. <laughs> and after she was gone, <laughs> my ex-husband and I were standing there going, well, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to put these things back up on the wall? <laughs> <laughs> this is who you are not. This is your pretend life, she says. You've got to go on the inside and find who you are. And that took, I think, about 20 years of my life. The amazing thing that I didn't get from the book, I don't know that it was in the book, but you told me was that brother who knew the Bible backwards and forwards couldn't read or write. And that was a shock when I discovered that. Because you see, when he took me on to his tutelage, now I'm carrying a Bible everywhere I go. And so he would say to me, get the Bible out. Today we are going to work in Deuteronomy. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, for example, verses 18 through 19. And I always assumed that I was doing the reading because he was an old man and his sight was failing him. Because as I began to read, he would also say the scripture along, along with me. And then sometimes you would say, now hold that piece of scripture that you have in Genesis. Now go to Luke chapter so and so and so and so. This was the statement and this was the manifestation. I mean, he knew that Bible backwards. So throughout the time that I interacted with him and his wife, of course, there were people we would say in this world that they were in poverty. I discovered that I was the one in poverty. I was impoverished spiritually. <laughs> and so every now and again, you know, I would, try to, I would try to offer money. And they wouldn't accept it. I would even sometimes even try to you know, buy clothes because they lived 
in what looked like a, a tribal village. Everybody knew, I mean, the whole tribe lived together, you know, when they lived off the land. And um, I, would, I would try to contribute and he would say, well, why do you want to take away my blessing? He would say, if I take the money from you, I'm already blessed. He said, I don't want the monetary blessing. I want the spiritual blessing. I want the blessing from God. And so I would always say, if there's anything that I can do, please let me know. So one Sunday afternoon, he shows up at our house with a box under his arm and a whole lot of paperwork in this box. And he said someone had died and left him some land. And he needed help to process this paperwork so that he can claim the land rightfully. But I was only too happy to help. And then again, I'm assuming here that I'm doing the writing because his eyesight is bad. (laughs) So when I was finished filling up all these forms, took about three days. I finally, you know how you put a you put an X marks the place where I want you to initial. And this tick here is the place where I want you to sign. And he took out this little container, this black stuff inside of it. And he put his finger in it. And I said, no, I don't need your thumbprint. I need your signature. And he looked at me and says, I can't write. I said, what do you mean you can't write? But you can read very well. And he says, I can't read either. And I said, well, how in the world? you know the Bible as well as you do. And he said, when I was a child, I knew that the Bible was a very sacred book. And I he said, very few people around me could read. And even in church, you had one person who could read the Bible, and even the pastor could not read the Bible. He said, he said but I wanted to be able to understand the Bible. And to know for myself what was in that, what was in there. So he said, from childhood, I began to sleep with the Bible open on my, he said, I would sleep on my back. And I, I began with opening the Bible at Genesis. And I would put it on my chest and put my hand over it to protect it. He says, and over many, many years, what was written in that Bible got transformed into my heart. Would you believe that? Yes. Amazing. Edgar Casey had could read books like that. He'd mm-hmm. sleep with a book and the information in the book would be transferred. Transferred. Brought well, it in. And Brought it. this is the only other person I've heard of that, <laughs> that had this ability to do. There you are. See, see, I didn't I didn't dream that up. I didn't know. I mean, I've read Edgar Casey, but I didn't know that that's the way he got. We are just about out of time. I wanted to mention uh because this is we've touched on a lot of a lot of things but you had a whole bunch of uh, wisdom keepers and in the end you are a wisdom keeper yourself and that's so they tell me (laughs) well i i believe it and i all all i've done is talk to you but i i am convinced that uh Anyway, there's this wonderful story at the end of your book about a condemned prisoner named Jerry Watson, who was angry and and you were terrified, really, to to try and counsel him. He was asking for a chaplain and uh, you didn't feel like you could give him anything. And in the end, you gave him everything spiritually. And he he credits you with taking him to his awakening. Mm -hmm. Uh, It struck me, of course, when I came to the end of the book that you had named the book Awakening. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I would really encourage people to just get the Kindle, if nothing else. It's so inexpensive. What was it, $2.99 or something like that? This book of yours is so full of wisdom from others and from yourself. And it gives such a, a, a beautiful picture of how we learn in our lives, how we mm-hmm. perhaps plan our lives in advance. And then if we're good about it, we learn incredible things according mm-hmm. to the plan. If we stick to the plan, it works. But first we have to get out of the illusion of the world. You see what's wrong with the world. What's wrong with us. Humanity is we, 
look to the world for guidance and for examples and for images of who we should be and what we should become. Rather than going inward and finding all that love and all that joy. You know, my life today is very, very in the midst of, and I think you may have, you may have read it in the book when sister read for me for the very first time. And she told me, if you, if you follow, if you follow the truth uh, in your elder days, you will be, you will find much peace and much joy. And that's exactly where I am today. In the middle of COVID and all the craziness going on in the world, I find myself very peaceful. And that peace comes from the source. Thank you, Reverend Norma Edwards, for sharing your story, the story of your NDE and the story of your incredible life. Norma, tell folks how they can find your book or how they might reach you, you know, the best way to, uh, to, to learn more about you. Well, first of all, I have an email address, and it's reprogram your life, as though it's one word, reprogram your life at yahoo.com. That's my email address. I have a website for the book that is called Awakening Dash, is a dash series, www awakening-series.com. And there you learn a lot more about the book. And the book can be bought on Amazon. It is on Amazon, www.amazon.com. And you just put uh, Norma Edwards, Awakening by Norma Edwards, and you can purchase it there. And I think they have the Kindle version as well. Yes, which is really great. Whenever there's a Kindle version available, I go for that because the type is big enough for me to read easily. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and also because I can have it within, you know, a minute. It, a minute, that's right. It's right That's there. right. That's right. I also want, before we, we, we close, I want to, to um, put a word in for IONS. I'm a member of IONS, yes. International Association of Near-Death Experiencers, and I have to say, believe it or not, it's only four years ago I discovered IONS. A friend of mine said to me, have you spoken to IONS? And I'd never heard of it. <laughs> and um, I attended the very first conference. And I have to tell you, by the end of the conference, I remember getting into a cab and getting to the airport. And when the sliding doors opened, I looked in the airport and I said, oh, my God, I live in a world full of chaos. Because you see, I had just left a wonderful five-day experience of light and love and meeting people who exude nothing but love and light. And, and we were a community of what I call light bearers. Yes. And I became a member of of IONS at that time. And I'm very impressed with the research they are putting behind their dead experiencer. I'm very, I'm very impressed with the opportunities that they're offering us near dead experiencers to share our stories and to answer questions and to enlighten the world. And, and I really, really would recommend them. For those people that would like to attend a, a real live conference rather than a Zoom conference, uh, we're planning to do another one in uh, Salt Lake City, you know, uh, mm -hmm. September 1st through 4th, I believe. Yes. And uh, I'm looking forward to being there. And I hope you'll be there too, Norm. Oh, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks so much. We're, we are definitely out of time. But if the listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 400 archived NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button. Or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE Radio library. And be sure to like, follow, and share our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.